Hello, everyone. I'm Rania Kalik, and this is Dispatches. For 60 years, the U.S. has tried and failed to destabilize the tiny island nation of Cuba. With a suffocating blockade, hundreds of assassination attempts, support for right-wing exiles, terrorism, endless propaganda, and more recently, by encouraging anti-government protests. All because Cuba dared to have a revolution and forge a path independent of U.S. interests and capitalism. Yet through it all, Cuba has survived and even thrived, developing its own highly effective COVID vaccine while dispatching doctors around the world. How did Cuba, up against this giant empire next door, succeed? How did they keep the revolution alive even as socialist projects in other global South countries failed with the collapse of the Soviet Union? What was the role of Che Guevara in laying the foundations for all of this? And what are Cuba's greatest challenges today? Here to break it all down is Helen Yaffe, a lecturer in economic and social history at the University of Glasgow and author of several books, including Che Guevara, The Economics of Revolution, and We Are Cuba, How a Revolutionary People Have Survived in a Post-Soviet World. Helen, welcome. Thank you for inviting me to the show. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Your books are so incredible, and I really do encourage people to go check them out. Um, I learned so, so, so much from from your work. And I, I, I guess before we kind of get into the meat of it, a good place to start would be if you could maybe tell our listeners and viewers, you know, how you ended up focusing so much on Cuba, like what motivated your engagement with this country? Okay, so I, as I say, actually, in the intro to both books, um, I um, went to live in Cuba in 1995 when I was 18 with my older sister, who was two years my senior. And um, anyone who knows a bit about the you know, outlines of Cuban history will know that that was more or less in the midst of what's known as the special period of economic crisis uh, following the collapse of the Soviet bloc um, and the pretty devastating impact that had on the Cuban economy. And we went to um, live in Cuba and see for ourselves, you know, what's this socialism business all about? And uh, we just had such an incredible experience. And um, we also helped to set up a solidarity campaign um, from, you know, being in Cuba to set up the first brigade of a group called Rock Around the Blockade. Um, which was, you know, to make links between young people in in the UK and in Cuba. Um, and I remember the first uh, brigade that we we went on and we organised, and it was um, in the countryside in where was it Santa Clara, so sort of more or less in the middle of Cuba, very uh, rural area. And there was a camp which had about three hundred young, mainly young volunteers. So these were people, um, many of them in their teenagers, who had volunteered to go and work in the countryside, uh, you know, the the most difficult work under the searing sun, up at 5.30 in the morning, um, a stale roll for breakfast and a small, you know, whatever there was for drinks, and to go out with their machetes and work in the fields. And um, we talked to them, and, you know, some of them were there for two months. And some of them were there for two years. And I remember talking to them, a teenager from, you know, capitalist, consumerist Britain, and saying to them, why did you volunteer? What made you do it? And, you know, they were explaining to us that their their response was, in a way, so alien to anything I could identify with, feeling about my own country and my own um, sort of sense of, you know, collective spirit. And they were saying, we are here to you know, um, defend the revolution, to defend socialism, because we have to make this sacrifice because everyone has to to contribute. And that was really my introduction to thinking about the relationship between consciousness um, Mm -hmm. in the sense of socialist collective consciousness and productivity, which, of course, you know, takes me straight to uh, Che Guevara, because that was his, his, his principal concern was, you know, how do you... Um, well, in, in the e- economic field, once the revolution had seized power, and he spent six years as a member of the Cuban government. And that was at the time when I did my PhD research into into his work in that period. It was really in English language texts 
very little had been written about what he was doing. And he was interested in this question, how can you um, raise productivity and efficiency within a socialist framework without depending on the capitalist mechanisms which create the kind of social relations that has led Cuba to the difficulties that the revolution is trying to address? So yeah, that was my engagement. It was very much from you know personal experience of being in Cuba at such a um, young age, a, a formational age. And um, I really took it from there. I returned to the UK, went to university and set up a Fulbo Vive student society. And so I met you know people who were also interested in Cuba and it was the special period. We were doing what we could to raise money for material aid. We were focusing on sound systems um music equipment disco equipment and that was actually interestingly what we were requested to focus on by the organization in cuba called the union of young communists so we were expecting when we approached them to say and we said we want to help we want to raise um you know raise money for material aid what should we prioritize and we thought it would be like health and education equipment but actually they were investing everything in those areas and they said um, you know really for us it's very important that young people don't feel alienated that young people don't associate socialism with austerity and, and, and hard times so it would be great if you could focus on sound systems for young people and that the contradiction in that period was um, incredible because I mean you, you might not remember this uh, I doubt you would but in the mid 1990s in Britain we were going through a period where the state was criminalizing youth culture. This was, this was the era of the emerging um, outdoor parties and they, the British government passed something called the Criminal Justice Act, which actually criminalized, criminalized music of more than 180 beats per minute. I mean, so you know, you don't stand there and measure them. So the, the contradiction was very stark. On the one hand, uh, you know, the British government was somehow threatened by youth culture. And on the other hand, the Cuban government, the Cuban institutions were saying, young people need entertainment, they need music, they need culture. And, you know, if you can help us with that, that would be great. So yeah, it was really amazing. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. That's a really good point. I think something similar was probably happening in the US at the time. There was like a huge you know, fear of hip hop music and a lot of censorship coming, you know, demands for censorship from um, government officials and Congress about how this music is causing violence. So that's actually like a really interesting parallel to the US and also, of course, the irony. But I do want to go back in time a bit because I think, you know, one of the reasons I think it's so important to talk about a country like Cuba isn't just because the U.S. is trying to suffocate it, but also because I think there's a lot to learn from it, especially as the issue of socialism becomes, I think, increasingly popular on among the left in the global north. So I want to go back in time to before the revolution uh, for a moment, because, um, you know, American politicians like to say that Cubans lost their freedoms after the revolution. But, you know, I want to share some statistics from your book. Uh, to give people an idea of what Cuba was like in the 1950s before the revolution. So you say that U.S. investors controlled 90 percent of the telephone and electronic services, 50 percent of public service railways, and 40 percent in raw sugar production. Nearly 35 percent of the working population was unemployed. Only 3 percent of rural Cubans owned the land they worked, and the average annual income of the largely rural population was 91 US dollars, which was one eighth that of Mississippi, the US's poorest state. More than 75% of rural dwellings were wooden huts and only 2% of rural Cubans had running water, 9% had electricity. Some 24% of the population was illiterate. Life expectancy was 59 years and infant mortality was 60 per 1,000 live births. And racist discrimination was rife and institutionalized. Obviously, you already know this, but I just want to give people an idea. And those statistics are really jarring. But based on these numbers, you know, it might seem obvious, like, why there was a revolution. But my question for you would be, why was there a revolution in Cuba? <laughs> <laughs> what were the conditions then? And what was, I guess, the U.S. role in creating those conditions? Yeah. So, I mean, it's very hard to give a sort of concise answer to that. I teach a course on the history of Cuba. So, you know, it's an arrow on each section. 
Um, but what I will, I, I just want to say that those statistics that you obviously took from my book, I drew on um, US uh, government department uh, documents and, you know, the uh, Catholic Association in Cuba. So, and then, you know, the census of Cuba in 1953. So I just want to say that that's where those statistics come from. They are generally accepted um, statistics. So one of the things that I focus on is the um, disparity between the urban and the rural scenario for people. Um, the, you know, because is a, the depiction of Cuba in the 1950s is um, very politicized. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. on the one hand, you have Cubanologists who focus on, you know, this prosperity and consumerism and the number of cars per capita was one of the highest in Latin America. And, um, you know, they look at the kind of companies that, that were there, the oil refineries and so on. And then on the other hand, you have uh, those who focus on this structural dependence on uh, trade with the United States. Uh, that meant that everything in Cuba was structured around the sugar industry uh, with its legacy of slavery and exploitation and this very short uh, work season for sugar cane workers. So they were employed for you know a few months of the year and the rest of the year was known as the dead season, El Tiempo Muerto because there was very other, uh, very little other alternative employment. So uh, clearly one of the defining features of Cuba was this disparity between the prosperous Havana scenario and the, um, uh, the, the rural situation. But you know, that all stems from, um, from this dependence on sugar and the domination by the United States investors. So it is interesting that in this period, the statistics you read out, um, US investments were not the majority of the sugar industry by then. That had been the situation before the Great Depression, before the crash 1929, when US capital retracted from Cuba as it did from the rest of Latin America. And uh, when it returned to Cuba, the sugar industry was the sugar sector was generally quite stagnant. Um, the workers in the industry were um, opposing mechanization, which would, you know, was seen as the way to raise productivity and so on. So they returned to public utilities, which was also a channel for corruption and graft and patronage and so on. And um, so most of the productive sector was dominated and the sort of big uh, air, profitable areas was dominated by um, U.S another foreign investment. And uh, generally, generally, this created a scenario in which uh, for Cubans to uh, become wealthy, become part of the elite, it was um, most beneficial to enter politics and the, uh, the political realm, which bred graft, corruption and patronage. And, you know, it was in incredible. This reached a new height after the um, coup of 1952, the Batista's coup. Um, you know, incredible payoffs for, for, for works that weren't done and all the rest of it. So also, you know, it's worth remembering, like the uh, similarly to the southern states of the United States of America, um, there was uh, discrimination based on race. So, you know, whites only beaches, whites only buses and, and all the rest of it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it just the the point is. I mean, there's this wonderful quote from Edward Borstein that I've actually, <laughs> I don't know if this is cheating, but I've used it in both of, of those books that you mentioned. And he says the key characteristic or the, the main way to understand the Cuban economy is not the domination of sugar or the domination of that industry, you know, of the US. The, the key way to understand it is US imperialism. And that created all the other structural conditions um, that Cuba uh, um, was suffering. And I would also encourage, I mean, we do this on my course, it's one of the primary sources we consult. I would encourage people to look at the famous speech, probably more people have heard of it than have actually read it, History Will Absolve Me, um, which was Fidel Castro's court defense uh, speech, which subsequently um, redacted. And it really lays out the conditions uh, that, you know, from the perspective of the revolutionary, very much so, the conditions that were facing the Cuban people, the socioeconomic conditions and how it affected different sectors.
So um, yes, on the one hand, if your agenda is to say that Cuba was close to what uh, Walt Rosto in his anti-communist, uh, non-communist manifesto uh, on the stages of, of economic growth said was take off stage. In other words, Cuba was close to taking off into a uh, you know high mass consumption. Um, you can look at GDP statistics per capita and say they were among the highest in Latin America. On the other hand, we have to recognize how questioned the value of GDP statistics is. What do they really tell us about the standard of living of the vast majority of the population? Um, and that is reflected in the statistics on infant mortality, on you know how many children were running around in the countryside with parasites in their bellies, how many people didn't have a toilet or electricity in their homes. I mean, 2% of rural population had access to eggs. You know, rural population where you, you think it would be easy to just yeah. get you the chickens in the backyard. So that, that was the condition. And, um, you know, we have to remember that the, the Cuba had basically been passed on from the Spanish with the defeat of the you know, the Cubans were very close to the winning the war of independence and basically passed over like a, a football to the United States. Massive surge of investment. They already had an economic rationale for wanting possession of Cuba. And um, it, so, you know, dependence on food imports, dependence on uh, manufactured goods imports, those were all legacies of domination uh, and dependence on trade which have proven very difficult for Cuba to overcome. So, I mean, it's all, it's, it's really interesting when then you look at the, you know, the revolution happens, it succeeds in overthrowing Batista. But what's so interesting is how there's a couple of years where it's not necessarily socialist, right? As you note in your book, the official announcement that the country was socialist didn't actually come until April, 1961. So after the revolution, there's still this, you know, bourgeoisie liberal class. They're even in government and the government that's set up by Fidel Castro. There's still a capitalist class in the country. So how is this particular contradiction ultimately, ultimately resolved? And I guess that's to say, you know, it wasn't inevitable that this revolution would turn socialist. So why did it? Yeah. So, um, I mean, it's really interesting because I, I have a copy of Bohemia. Bohemia is a magazine. Um, it's actually, I believe, the oldest, longest running magazine in Latin America, and it's Cuban. And um, one copy that I have from early in the, uh, well, maybe it's late in 1959, but early in the revolution. On one side, a double page spread uh, two, on the two pages. On one side, you have meet Comandante Che Guevara. <laughs> he was the leader of this column and so on and presenting him to the readers. And on the other side, you have an advert for Coca-Cola. And it really exemplifies that tension in those those first um, sort of slightly over two year period. But it is worth saying the the declaration of uh, that Cuba was socialist was on the eve of the Bay of Pigs invasion in April 1961. But again, as Borstein pointed out, there were um, a whole set of new ministries that were announced in the Gazette Oficial, Oficial the official Gazette. Um, late in October 1960, and um, they, you know, these these were laying the basis for the, you know, the new institutions uh, that would be necessary part of the transition to new power structure, new social relations, and so on for a centrally planned state-dominated economy, which is what happened. So, but that period is fascinating because there. The, the outcome is not certain and there are constant battles and um, you can see that the forces, even within the movement for the 26th of July, uh, there's a struggle for power. Will this, you know, just re remain within the framework that ex is acceptable to Washington and be a sort of project of national capitalism, maybe renegotiate? the power balance between the Cuban bourgeoisie, the Cuban capitalist class and, and US uh, investors and so on? Or will, will the revolutionary um, leadership be consistent with the program of Moncada, with the uh, commitments made, the five revolutionary laws that are articulated by Fidel Castro in his uh, speech, History Will Absolve Me, and carry out that program. Now, 
the problem, the, the issue is, the sort of historical debate is that in that program, there was no mention of socialism. And in fact, there's mention of having, you know, calling um, uh, multi-party elections and so on. But the question, the, the, the historical debate is, was it possible to carry out the rest of the program, the socio and economic um, aims of the program without coming into conflict with, first of all, US imperialism, so US interests and investors, and through that, their domestic allies in the Cuban um, bourgeoisie, the weak bourgeoisie of capitalist class. So, you know, this is one of the debates. Was the um, decision of the, you know, Fidel Castro, out that that part of the leadership of the movement of 26th of July, um, it made it its alliance with the Cuban Communist Party and the Revolutionary Student um, Organization. Then it moved quite radically to the left, quite um, quite quickly to the left. Was that inevitable, or was that in the perception of you know many of those who were part of that, and then um, went off to Miami and rejected the the progress? Was that a betrayal? of a, a project of national capitalism. And that's one of the debates that, that we discuss. And really to understand that you need to, well, do two things. One is know a bit about Cuban history, know about the very important role and politics of Jose Marti, the um, anti-imperialism expressed by Jose Marti, particularly in his final letter um, that he wrote just on the eve of going into the battle, when, which is when he, lost, when he was killed. Um, and then the other is to, Locate Cuba, you know, there's so much Cuban exceptionalism, especially for <laughs> Cubans. Um, but to, to step back and actually locate Cuba as a small island nation, colonized for 400 years and then subject to imperialism. Um, and it is part of a broader challenge. And that is the challenge of development. How do uh, underdeveloped countries get the resources that they need get the finance, the capital they need to invest in infrastructure and social welfare and what their populations need to raise the standard of living, improve their lives. But to get that, those resources and that capital to harness it in ways that don't then obstruct their development. So that is the real challenge that Cuba faced. And the way that I um, perceive it or articulate it is for the, the, those who came out in the leadership of the movement of the 26th of July, in the leadership of the revolutionary state, they concluded very quickly that for Cuba, the answer or the solution to the challenge of development was to use the state as a lever for channeling resources uh, to have a development that would meet the needs of the population and national development project. And the mechanism for doing that is a socialist state dominated planned economy and that's why you know they um you know in some ways the actions of the united states also forced their hand when the u.s uh, it was clear it became clear to the cubans that the u.s was going to implement some kind of sanctions embargo blockade and so they had to plan they were forced to plan they were forced to go to the ministries and entities and workplaces and say what are your the resources you need for production, what's in your inventory, what do we need to get before this blockade is implemented? So, you know, the, the plan was actually their solution as well to the US using the market as a way to obstruct their development. It's lovely the US being the inspiration for socialism. <laughs> Who would have thought? Um, I want to talk a little bit about the importance of Che Guevara in this post-revolutionary period, because, you know, he's not just, as you've said, he's not just this shallow icon on T-shirts. <laughs> um, but, you know, he's, you know, obviously he's popular for playing this very crucial role as like this revolutionary militant training with and fighting, you know, with guerrilla movements in Cuba, the Congo, Bolivia, and of course being killed in Bolivia with the help of the CIA. But what's less known about him is what you wrote about him in the economics of revolution. And again, I really do encourage people, if they haven't, to check that book out. Um, 
you know, you, you talk about how he served in the senior capacity in the Cuban government for six years after the revolution. Uh, he was minister of industry, head of national bank and, you know, more many other different hats. And he shaped and implemented, you know, policy in basically constructing this new socialist state. Can you briefly explain how pivotal he was in the post-revolutionary Cuba, his basically his lasting contributions also to Cuba's like military, political, and economic consolidation of the revolution. And I know that's a very big question. Um, and you wrote a the, whole these book are all in massive it. questions. Can you, can you condense your, your I book into? Did I, did I answer that? Oh my god, I could have done a Fidel speech on that. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, could you condense your book into like a few minutes? Basically, what I'm asking you, a big deal. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what you're asking me to do. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, Che, like his, if you had to, I guess, near, like, you know, tell someone who doesn't know, what what was Che Guevara's contribution to post-revolutionary Cuba? So he had very important roles um, in the political sphere and the economic sphere, which are, you know, beyond the well-known roles in the military sphere. And his interest in production actually begins during the um, guerrilla warfare period when he is, uh, you know, has his own column and the uh, column under Che Guevara begins to, you know, set up artisanal production. And then he gets to La Cabana when they enter Havana. So, you know, after the 1st of January, they take over the military base in Havana. La Cabana is called and he um, immediately again sets up, you know, small workshops for production and so on. But even before that, while he was still in Santa Clara, so a couple of uh, months before the revolution comes down from, uh, takes over the middle of Cuba and then proceeds into Havana, he was um, sending messages through the underground network asking for books about Cuban history and the Cuban economy, because he was already thinking ahead. And many of the people I interviewed said, you know, they had joined the guerrilla. They were maybe, you know, young peasants uh, or, you know, taxi drivers in the city, uh, semi-literate or Ill illiterate. And they had joined the guerrilla and they were, you know, in the first days after the revolutionary forces seized power, they were like celebrating. Yay, it's all done now. I'm off home. And Che said, no, no, it's just starting now. This is when the hard work starts. And so, you know, he um, had a group of bodyguards around him. He persuaded them to, to stick around to, um, you know, learn the skills that they needed. And they just faced this incredible challenge. The Che was put very early on in charge of industry um, in a country dominated by, by sugar, which had never had a ministry of industry previously. And Che's first put in charge of the head of, the head of industrialization in a department in a, in um, and, and the Agrarian Reform Institute. And um, he's there in this position when the nationalizations start to happen. And so, like, I just had some incredible conversations with Orlando Borrego, who is one of the main people that I interviewed, who was Che's number two. He had been a lieutenant in the um, column with Che, and then he was one of the few people who had any accountancy experience. So, he, you know, Che had made him deputy of the Department of, uh, of Industrialization. And, you know, these um, tit for tat relations were going on, these all night meetings of the Council of Ministers. And suddenly it was being declared that from tomorrow morning, 200 US companies will now be nationalized. And they're running around like headless chickens saying, well, we have to find 200 new administrators to take these these um take over to run these uh, industries and who do you know and you know do, do they have any management experience do they have any uh, administrative experience can they do accounting uh, are they with the revolution you know did they have anything to do with batista because they can't you know they can't be involved and, and it was just an incredible process and che was part of that and really if you look at that period of transition um, quite a traumatic transition from, you know, the in terms of everything changes, right? Not only the ownership changes, but also the accounting system changes. So they go from, you know, capitalist accounts to socialist accounts and uh, new relationships between workers and management. Um, 
supply is different, the, the um, spare parts, you know, they can't get the spare parts for the machinery from the US and everything changes. And yet in this period, there is not a collapse of industry. It is quite phenomenal. I spoke to a Cuban economist who said, you know, uh, it, it's a real testament to Che Guevara's capacity to, to uh, oversee and mobilize resources, to, to plan and to strategize that there wasn't a economic trauma in that in that sector and in fact industry diversified and grew under his leadership um, so yeah I mean that that was just in one field he had um, also I think one of his biggest contributions we have to say is his critical his critical eye right his critical analysis so um, he hadn't really been a member of a, you know, a communist party. He wasn't, uh, you know, part of the sort of uh, traditional left communist parties that was starting to split. Well, they were already split between Trotskyism and Stalinism, and then later you have the, the Sino-Soviet split. But Che comes from a much more self-taught perspective. He is traveling around Latin America. He is seeing firsthand the impact, as he sees it, of US imperialism on social relations in Latin America. He's seen real misery. He's seen revolutionary uh, attempts. He's seen the, the uh, overthrow of Jaco Alben's um, government in Guatemala, which brought for him many big lessons, which he you know, discussed with Fidel Castro about the importance of uh, revolutionary forces having an, an independent army and so on. And um, he has this critical eye. And so when he starts to, you know, uh, what was it, June 1959, so just a few months after the revolution, he is leading, despite not being a Cuban, he is leading Cuba's, the new Cuban government's first overseas mission. And he goes to visit what later become known as the sort of non-aligned countries. And among them is Yugoslavia, which is a, a socialist country, but it's split from the Soviet Union. And so he's seeing the kind of industries that are being promoted and science institutes. And this trip has a very big impact on him. And I've written a bit about it in, in the book on Che. But he also then subsequently goes to the Soviet Union. And, you know, he's taking with him his reading of Marx. He's um, at the same time uh, reading, going through uh, like educational classes, reading Capital, and this Soviet professor has been sent, you know, by Moscow to, to take the leadership of Cuba through these um, capital reading classes. And I spoke to quite a few people who'd been in, in the capital reading group that Che was doing, which started at nine, I think on a Thursday night, nine at night, and often ended at three or four in the morning. The professor ended up often pulling his hair out saying, I can't answer Che's critiques, you know, because he was, had such a penetrative analysis. And he was saying things like, if Marx points to the role of the law of value as being the sort of like operational law of, of capitalist development, yes, it precedes capitalist development, but then it finds its full expression in capitalist development and then subsequently is um, sort of obscured by other factors, market factors, then how can... How can it be right that when we read the Soviet manual of political economy, they're talking about the need to develop the law of value? Now, I don't want, I don't want to subject your listeners to a sort of heavy explanation of the law of value, but, but essentially, um, you know, it's, it is what Che regards as the crux of, um, of a capitalist system. So what he says is, we know we can't get rid of the law of value. So people sell their labor power as a commodity, they're paid according to their work, there's private property, there's exchange, uh, there's, um, exchange of uh, commodities, and so on, and all these elements are their expressions of the law of value. And we know we can't get rid of them overnight, right? Because we are an underdeveloped country and we have to build up the means of production, we have to build up our uh, productive capacity and so on. But um, surely everything we should do, we do, should be moving us away from the law of value. Whereas what the Soviets are saying is, in a sense, we need to increase our industrial capacity, production and productivity. 
and then we'll deal with the question of consciousness and then we'll deal with the new person, new social relations and so on. And what Che was arguing is if you don't try to develop production and productive capacity alongside socialist consciousness, you will undermine the your ability to do so later because you'll be reproducing capitalist uh, social relations and the consciousness that comes from that. So it's very, very complex. And there are some fascinating reflections that he makes in 1965 in his final meeting, which most people didn't know it was his final meeting, but as Minister of Industries, he held these um, every two months, these uh, in internal meetings of the um, Ministry of Industries with all of the directors and vice ministers and so on. And fortunately for us historians, um, Orlando Borrego had arranged for these to be taped. So there are transcripts. There's only 100 copies. I managed to access one and it's absolutely incredible. It's, you know, nearly 800 pages, very small text, um, literally a transcript of chain, every kind of possible mood, sometimes rousing and, and inspiring and sometimes moaning and complaining he says what's the problem do i have to sort out every problem here are there not a hundred chays and you know sometimes <laughs> reflective and, and and philosophical and you know how do we change the sort of spirit of, of of people how do we make how do we enable workers to actually feel that they are the owners of what they produce socially and collectively and not just tell them oh but you're the workers you're the you're the owners because workers manage production you know all these sorts of things um, and in his final uh, meeting he makes some really uh, philosophical reflections on you know have we how far have we got in terms of changing consciousness but what he did as minister of industries what was so fascinating why i think his contribution is so important is he he tried to solve this problem what practical policies can you introduce that will be consistent with the ideological political principles that we're trying to pursue so it's all very well you know criticizing the soviet union saying oh they're um too focused on material incentives the profit motive competition uh the law of value expressions of the law of value what we need to do is create this new consciousness and so on. But what policies can you introduce to encourage that process? And and what Che did, and I have to say, it became very clear to me through my research that this was endorsed 100% by Fidel Castro, who gave Che Guevara the institutional and the political space to carry out new policies, experimentation, based on a, a, quite an overt critique of Soviet, of the dominant Soviet political economy, at a point where the Cuba, Cuba was becoming increasingly politically and economically dependent on the Soviet alliance and its integration, not at that point, but later um, in the Council of Mutual Economic Assistance. So incredibly, um, it, it shows the integrity and bravery, really, of both Fidel Castro and, and Che to carry out this critique. I mean, in that last meeting, he says, I don't discuss uh, with the Soviets, I don't discuss political economy with the Soviets anymore, because, you know, I, I also have to represent the government. And, you know, and, and there were all these tensions. He said, they told me about this system. They, they said, do I know about this new management system they're operating? And I said, yeah, I know that system. I knew it from Argentina. It's called capitalism. <laughs> so, you know, he was saying that to these uh, leading Soviets. And um, and that was, you know, what, 1964, 1965. So very early on, saying that the Soviet Union is heading back to capitalism. And not because he's looking in a crystal ball, but because he's basing his analysis on, first of all, going back to Marx's, you know, analysis of capital, but also his earlier philosophical works. Um, and secondly, he was engaged with, aware of the political economy debates taking place from the 50s into the 60s in the uh, broader socialist bloc countries, so particularly Poland um, and, and, you know, all those countries. And also, interestingly, 
his analysis and his system of his budgetary finance system, which is really what the, the book on my book on Che centers on, um, draws on the, the, the efficiencies, the technological and administrative efficiencies of the capitalist corporations in Cuba. And he um, argues that, you know, they have centralized budgets, they have, you know, introduced the, the most up-to-date technology, whereas things like cybernetics are embraced by, under the capitalist production, but were rejected initially by the Soviet Union for ideological reasons. And Che says, you know, what's the difference? If, we, if a US tractor works more efficiently than a Bulgarian one, why shouldn't we get the US one? <laughs> You know, or, or the same with the rifles uh, during the war. What what mattered was was not where it came from. It was how it was being used and for what function. So he develops this budgetary finance system. Um, I think it's really important because it shows that the Cuban revolution, which had quite distinct origins, always forges its own path. And that is really important to acknowledge because it counters many of the sort of Cubanologist paradigms that the Cuban revolution is a satellite state of the Soviet Union, uh, that the Cuban revolution wouldn't exist. I mean, certainly would it have survived that first initial period without the Soviet Union? Very unlikely when, you know, when the, um, the trade with the US was first cut off. On the other hand, we were uh, or we were told for many years that it only survived due to the Soviet Union, and now the Cuban Revolution has existed longer since the collapse of the Soviet bloc than before. But um, Che's contribution is very important. And what one thing, other thing I would say, and I've got a chapter on the legacy, and I talk about how people um, in ongoing and very deep debates that do take place in Cuba, contrary to much propaganda. What? Um, they they also frame proposals still in relation to Che. Yeah, so I talk about in my final chapter the, the Gavarisa pendulum. So people might say, you know, we we understand, yeah, what Che said. He's right, but we can't get to that point now, right? So they are still framing a, a certain pr practical position or pragmatic position in relation to conditions and how far it takes them from where Che, uh, you know, che, che Guevara's analysis and his vision. Yeah, I mean, it's really, uh, so he's really an exceptional human being, but he's also still a human being. And I think one thing I love about learning about him through your book is it's like you get this important takeaway of actually some he actually he and a lot of other people actually built socialism it doesn't come like ready made out of a box with like a user manual they like constructed it based on their own local material conditions they worked with what they had and it's just it, it really does also like break down what you said this idea of oh like and I think this feeds into the next thing I want to ask you about is, you know, oh, Cuba is this satellite state of the Soviet Union. Um, and it did. It went through like, you know, obviously they had the budget, the budgetary finance system that you detail uh, under Che Guevara. And then ultimately they do end up adopting that that Soviet model command economy. And there's sort of like different stages that you you go through of the of the Cuban economy in your book. But. I want to get to that special period, which you talk about in your recent book, which is after the Soviet collapse. Um, and of course, you mentioned, you know, obviously Cuba has, you know, obviously the Soviet Union was super important to 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 Cuba being able to survive after the U.S. cut it off through the blockade. Um, and and that, you know, I'm not like denying that. But one thing that's so interesting is after the Soviet collapse, unlike a lot of other countries that were socialist and a part of that so socialist bloc, that ended up transitioning to capitalism in ways that were so devastating, like a lot of those countries are still haven't even recovered. Cuba remained socialist, which I think is really extraordinary. Um, and that's of course ironic, because as you said, like Cuba's depicted at the Soviet satellite state, but now, you know, Cuba's lasted longer without the Soviet Union than with it. But I guess all that's to say, you know, how did Cuba, unlike a lot of other countries that were socialist at the time, how did Cuba manage to survive after the Soviet Union collapsed? 
<laughs> so the short big question. <laughs> yeah, no, no, the short answer is read my book. <laughs> but that's not fair. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to say more than that. I mean, look, the first thing is political commitment and the political will to, to again, going back to that belief that actually the answer to for Cuba in this crisis, this crisis of development, economic crisis, um, was to harness the state, but not just that, you know, a, a top down, a state that is directing resources in the interest of its population. So that's the first thing, very clear early on. In fact, there's a there's a speech that I um, I think I start the chapter with. Fidel Castro does a speech. It's a year and a half before the collapse of the um, USSR, and the writing is on the wall. But he also has this. Uh, you know, it's been pointed out to me by Cubans that I interviewed. It's very important. This letter that Ch uh, Che Guevara, going back to Che, wrote him in 1965 when he left Cuba uh, first for the Congo. The fight there and he um, has his analysis of what's going to happen in the Soviet Union and uh, Fidel Castro has had that since 1965 and um, so drawing on that drawing on the obvious signs the Soviets had um, stopped the, the military support they you know there were movements uh, it, it was all it was clearly the writing was on the wall and Fidel Castro said you know if and we hope it never happens if the Soviet Union should collapse, we will continue fighting and we will stay socialist. And then he also warned, you know, the US won't let a grain of grain of rice come in and, and how they would try to tighten the blockade. Because if you think about it, the, the relationship with the Soviets, 86% to 87% of trade and investment with the socialist bloc, mainly the USSR, um, really cushions them from the impact of the U.S. blockade. The U.S. blockade mm -hmm. can be, it's, it's bilateral, yes, between the United States and Cuba, but it is also um, uh, imposed on the rest of the world. The U.S. can use its domination of the dollar, of the international financial system, to ensure that the blockade affects Cuba's relationship with the rest of the world. And they could foresee that. So, um you know, it's really interesting that this declaration by Fidel Castro came a year and a half before the collapse of the USSR. And, you know, the Cubans I spoke to said it shocked us. We were like, what do you mean if the Soviet bloc collapses? But um, they, you know, they prepared a certain amount of reserves and they really buckled down politically. I think that that was the first and most important element was the political decision um, the Communist Party played a very important role, but they also drew on the collective um, organizing capacity and the collective spirit of their grassroots organizations. So all Cubans, um, on the whole, unless you know they're oppositional Cubans, participate in, in probably several grassroots organizations. So those might be maybe the Communist Party or the Youth Communist Party. Um, League, but they, uh, unit, rather Union of Young Communists, but they, um, you know, they have restricted membership. So you have to meet a certain standard and you have to be approved by your peers and so on to, to be able to be in the communist cadre. But then there are organizations of the masses, such as the Women's Federation, the um, street committees, the committees for the defense of the revolution, which are organized from street level up. And um, then you have the Small Farmers Association. And you have various other organizations of the masses. So most Cubans are uh, engaged and participate through those what are called grassroots organizations. So those are very much integrated into the state apparatus. They have um, members elected into the National Assembly and also into representation at different levels. So they harness their, their mobilizing capacity and they also a lot of the solutions that got them through the special period and literally the practical level of keeping the population fed came bottom up. So the example that I give in my book is um, people started to just grow fruit and veg in their garden or say if a house had collapsed and there was some wasteland, they'd grow fruit and veg and share it for themselves and share them with the neighborhood. And the Cuban authorities at different levels saw the how, um, you know how useful this was and then 
they not only permitted it, but they encouraged it, they facilitated it, and they expanded it into a national movement. And so that was the urban gardening and what became the organic, the, um, the sort of uh, organic urban farms. Um, so, you know, those end up within what, 15 years, they're employing, you know, hundreds of thousands of people and they're supplying Havana with, you know, 100% of fruit and veg and so on. So lots, uh, they, at a time of economic crisis, interestingly, the Cubans deepened and extended their uh, system of political representation. So a certain degree of um, resurrecting and extending popular councils in neighborhoods, that was another mechanism. Then they could also, I mean, it's, it's an, quite an incredible fact that during this, this decade of crisis, the special period, um, they suffered massively from a lack of medicines. We're seeing that again today, right? Because of the um, tightening of sanctions under Trump. But you know, when I first lived there, you'd go into a pharmacy and they'd have a couple of bottles of something, you know, and that was it. And it was basically dust on the shelves. And um, how did they compensate or offset that, which was clearly a crisis? They trained more doctors, nurses, and, and other forms of medics. It's just incredible. The numbers of, um, old people's homes go up, nurses, dentists, doctors, in that period of economic crisis. So they used, uh, um, you know, human personnel, yeah, to, to replace the technology and the medicines that they, they um, could, were struggling to access. However, what I try to explain in my book is there were some um, serious strategic areas of um, government investment and development that had some like biotechnology that had begun in the 1980s. So while their Soviet Union was still around and Cuba was part of the Council of Mutual Economic Assistance and they had a, a sort of a socialist division of labor and Cuba was allocated the role to continue to be an exporter of principally sugar, but also citrus and they also had nickel. However, against the advice and encouragement of the Soviet bloc, they also began to develop a biotech sector. And, you know, they, they there's quite substantial investments made in the 1980s. And it very, very, I mean, within, you know, within months of it being established, they have already proven how important it could be when they confront a, a dengue epidemic in 1981. But they, these investments continue. What happens? You have this incredible crash, yeah, incredible economic trauma. And, um, you know, I spoke to some of the, you know, Augustin Lahe, who was, who was the director of the Center for Molecular Immunology, which today boasts the world's only cancer immunotherapy, uh, lung cancer immunotherapy. And he said, you know, we all thought that would be it. Those investments would stop. But in fact, Fidel Castro took the decision or argued, because he had to argue his case too, argued very strongly that this was more reason to invest in our uh, domestic biopharma sector. And they did. So they had three areas that were protected. There was, um, you know, budget cuts all over, you know, belt tightening for everyone. But they protected biotechnology, tourism, because tourism became the um, new source of revenue, there's lots of reasons for that. Tourism is labor intensive, so it employs a lot of people. The income comes quickly. It doesn't require um, years of, of investment and a small investment can, can kickstart uh, quick returns and so on. And then food production. So those three areas are protected during by, by the state, you know, during the special period. And, and I think today, if we... <laughs> I know you don't want to jump ahead, but if we were to jump ahead to today and COVID-19, I mean, hasn't that decision proven to be um, incredibly, shown incredible foresight, you know, in a, in a world where um, inequality based on access to vaccines for COVID-19, much less, you know, the fact that children are dying every few seconds of diarrhea and malnutrition, right? And, um, you know, and the Cubans in that special period they invested in that. Um, biotechnology has become, before COVID, before Trump measures, it has become one of uh, Cuba's main goods exports. 
but still what they earn from it is is pretty minimal and clearly this is a sector that was developed with public health uh, of the human population as a priority. And yeah, I mean, now not only does it have vaccines to show for it, it has these amazing medical brigades that like go around the world. They were crucial even before COVID during the Ebola epidemic. Uh, they, they've been crucial. Uh, and also training doctors like Cuba has this program, right, where doctors from the region like go and train and learn for free, basically, in Cuba. And they can go back to their countries and offer this skill to, I mean, I know one Honduran doctor who like after going to medical school in Havana goes back to his like indigenous village in Honduras and opens the first clinic, like opens basically the first hospital there. I mean, uh, it's amazing what happens when you invest in public health, but I mean, it is okay to bring it into the present because that's what I want to ask you about next is, um, with all this incredible history in mind, Cuba is still under blockade and it's only worsened. I wanted to ask you about how this blockade has gotten worse specifically under, you mentioned Trump, but also continued under Biden. And I do wanna ask you also about Cuba's like amazing COVID response, but before we get into that, also how how is this blockade specifically hampering Cuba's ability to respond the way it would like to to COVID? And of course the other living conditions that it's that have deteriorated as a result. Okay, so it, I mean, just a, one quick example. At the beginning of COVID, Cuban medical scientists sent a team, you know, literally January 2020, sent a team to China to study the virus, to learn from their Chinese counterparts what was happening. And it was clear that they were going, they said it was clear to us we were going to need ventilators, medical ventilators for ICU units, because this was a, a respiratory disease. And um, they immediately set out to try and get new. Uh, medical ventilators. However, in you know, in the response, I think it was in the response to um, COVID. You know, you had this incredible monopolization of resources by the wealthy countries and by private companies. Uh, they had um, previously bought medical ventilators from two Swiss companies, and they had been bought out by a US company. And under US legislation. Um, which, is, by the way, is you know should should only be uh, relevant in in U.S. jurisdiction, but is implemented extraterritorially. They uh, those Swiss companies could no longer sell um, their medical ventilators, nor could they even sell them spare parts for the ventilators they had. So that is just one example. Another is um, you probably you may have remember that Jack Ma from Alibaba, the Chinese. Um, uh, corporation made a donation of PPE and um, other equipment for Latin American Caribbean countries for dealing with COVID. And because the donation was being flown in a US aircraft, it couldn't land in Cuba and drop off the donation for Cuba. So, I mean, this has just been on and on. One of the biggest things that happened, um, well, I mean, we, we can do this in statistics, right? Trump came in. Uh, and he, you know, started making threatening noises. And like many people thought, well, this this blockade's been going for 60 years. It's comprehensive. It's based on six major legal statutes in the United States. It's already extraterritorial. What more can they do? But somehow they found uh, ways to extend and deepen the, the sanctions, uh, which make them unprecedented. 243 new coercive um, action sanctions and um, other measures taken to, to make Cuba's access to resources more difficult, to the international financial system, to international trade, to block off uh, partnerships, to scare off investors, and including over 50 of them since the pandemic began. And one of the most uh, aggressive and detrimental measures was a few days before Trump left office, maybe even the day before, I can't quite remember. But very vindictively, the US administration put Cuba back on the list of states, state sponsors of terrorism. Now, Cuba had been on that list and uh, Obama only moved, removed Cuba from the list shortly before the end of his mandate. However, in the interim, banks have been, you know, caught in big um, 
money laundering scandals. And so they have massively strengthened their departments for, um, you know, securing themselves against fines and accusations of wrongdoing. And there is incredible fear among international financial institutions of being fined and with good reason because fines for uh, violating US, yeah, they are national jurisdiction, but they are applied extraterritorially because countries won't stand up against um, US, uh, you know, power structure. Um, the, the, they are, there have been multi-million and even multi-billion dollar fines against financial institutions for um, transactions with Cuba as well as Iran and another handful of countries. I mean, a French bank was fined under Obama nearly nine billion. So you're talking about really heavy fines and financial institutions are terrified. Cuba's been put back on this list by Trump, hasn't been removed by Biden. And basically what that means is the number of banks in the world that will even contemplate a transaction with Cuba Today, you can count on one hand and possibly two, two fingers. So, you know, what does this mean? How can Cuba engage and carry out trade and get payment for, this, for its medical services overseas? How can people send donations, people send remittances? Every single, what should be a standard systemic, uh, you know, interaction with Cuba has become extraordinarily difficult. Because uh, because of this, these incredibly punitive sanctions, you know, and, and it's clear that no one in the world thinks that Cuba is a state sponsor of terrorism. No other country, no other government, even a hostile government has come out and said, you know, they support that statement. It's absolutely punitive. And it's very clear that they, they feel that they are creating a... Um, a pressure cooker in Cuba and they just, you know, they just keep need to push a bit further, push a bit further. And, you know, they think that the revolutionary re regime, the society will collapse. Well, I, you know, there are big problems in Cuba. The Cubans are really suffering, but that collapse is not imminent. And what is actually happening is that Cubans are being forced to suffer more and more on a daily basis needlessly i mean you know scarcities of medicine so if you go back into pharmacies it's it's reminiscent of those 1990 conditions that i talked about queues uh, i've been to cuba twice during the pandemic and you know i live with a cuban family and you know they they like everyone else they're up at four in the morning or five in the morning to go and stand in queues that for shops that sometimes don't even open till 10 or 11 you know and the government is it, you know it gives people are a ticket each and you stand in line and the government is trying to, as it did in the 1990s, um, ensure that a, a shrinking pie is being shared out as equally as possible so no one is starving. But you know, the, the um, level of daily suffering is, uh, is rising and it is exhausting. I mean, things are slightly better now. I think I feel more positive than if we, you know, having spoke, if I did, who I was talking to in the summer, because the COVID situation has essentially been conquered. Um, almost the entire Cuban population is fully vaccinated. They're very close to that figure. So among the leading um, few countries in the world and the first country in the world to vaccinate all of their children from two years up. So, you know, the schools have opened, the borders have opened. Again, we'll have to see what happens with Omicron. But the borders have opened. There's a lot of, um, a lot, there's, people are very keen to get back to Cuba, to go and visit Cuba. So we'll see what happens. But yeah, the um, sanctions against Cuba have been punishing, really, really punishing. And again, it's a, creating a, an economic crisis, but it's externally forced. You know, it's externally imposed on Cuba. Um, and it, it is interesting to see the, the extent to which they are going back and looking at some of the creative solutions and co collaborative collective solutions that they had during the 1990s. Yeah, it's really 
I mean, under, you know, but it makes Marco Rubio feel better. So <laughs> that's the upside. But no, it is. It's, it's unbelievably cruel. And of course, it's not just Cuba um, that these sorts of policies are being implemented against. I think right now the U.S. is like sanctioning like a third of the world. It's insane. Uh, but Cuba really seems like the gets the worst of it and also kind of like the lab for it. I mean, Cuba has been under blockade for so long. That's where all of those methods of really you know, punishing the population at large, I think we're tested out on. And I think one, you know, one thing that's been really interesting to see is how Cuba was like the only country in Latin America to develop this incredibly effective vaccine. I think it's like 93 or 94 percent efficacy, which is as high as the or as high as the vaccines as the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. Um, yet they had to appeal to the international like solidarity movement for syringes because of this blockade. I mean, it's completely insane. And you mentioned you've been there a couple of times since COVID started and you actually were there during the July 11th protests that had the entire US political class like salivating at the idea that anybody in Cuba would protest. But there yeah. were of course some protests that day. And so I'm curious, you know, from what you witnessed what were those protests about and how how significant was it and how related were those protests aside from like the U.S. encouragement of them? How related were they to these deteriorating living conditions that we're talking about? Yeah. So, I mean, you say I witnessed, but this is an interesting question, right? I was there on the 11th of July and I was leaving a quarantine hotel where we'd had to stay um, on arrival in Cuba and I crossed part of Havana and I saw nothing. I knew nothing. Literally, I found out what had happened when I was watching, for my sins, I have to admit, I was watching the European Championships football because England was in the final, right? And halfway through, the game is interrupted by an announcement by Miguel Diaz Canal, the president of Cuba. So like many Cubans, probably millions of Cubans who didn't happen to be plugged into social media and, you know, all the algorithms or whatever, they, you know, weren't relevant. I found out that there had been violent protests from the president of Cuba. Now, I just before I came on here to talk to you, I was listening to a podcast by a very a highly esteemed Cuban American academic. I'm not going to mention the name, but she talked about. She was asked. That was the first question she was asked. And she talked about 150,000 protesters. So, you know, I, I think this is incredible. One of the things that I witnessed was how massively exaggerated these protests were. Now, I don't want to sound like I'm defensive or making excuses. There were protests. It was shocking to see on the telly, because I saw it on Cuban telly. Not, or I didn't see it in the street because it wasn't that prevalent, um, to see people being violent in the street in Cuba. Why? Why was it shocking? Because the last violent protest in Cuba of a political nature was in 1994. 94, 27 years ago, during the worst period of the special period that we've been talking about. And it was a protest on the Malacom, one place in Havana. So this was, uh, it, the, the fact of it was shocking. And it's significant. So we don't want to... Um, sort of discount that but what i realized you know the internet was cut off for a couple of days why was the internet cut off because clearly and i've done a little bit more research and i've written about you know the first facebook page that promoted the first protest that went violent that then went viral on social media and so on and um, what is clear is that these were coordinated and amplified and and so on from outside right um so when the internet was recollected after about two days two and a half days, um, many Cubans have reconnected on a VPN, which I subsequently find out was, you know, originally funded by the State Department and <laughs> has a very political uh, 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 sort of motive for being set up. Um, when I did connect and I was seeing the news that was being broadcast, these fake images that have, were being circulated so wild, widely and messages from people who, you know, aren't even necessarily political, asking me if I was okay, if I was safe. You know, and the next day, the day on the 12th of July, I again got up and I had to travel. I'm in a part of Havana where transport's not that easy and I had buses and 
a collective taxis and traveled through Havana, walked around the center and got my press credentials for doing the document, for making that documentary. And there was a tense atmosphere, yes. I saw nothing. Now I was there, what's going on, what's going on? Oh no, two people are just saying hello to each other very noisily in the street. <laughs> but people were in their workplaces watching the Cuban television and a four hour broadcast where Miguel Diaz Canal, the president of Cuba, and more or less all the ministers came out and spoke to the, to the public about what had happened, but contextualizing it. So what had happened is there's an area of Havana on a, a, a sort of a barrio outside Havana, a fairly poor, slightly more rural area, uh, San Antonio de los Baños, and they had been suffering from electricity blackouts. Why electricity blackouts? Well, it certainly mm -hmm. wasn't because the government was being manipulative. It's because they have um, maintenance problems and they are struggling, again, going back to the US blockade. They're struggling to get the spare parts they need. They're struggling with finances because COVID has cut off all of the revenue, the important source of revenue from tourism, from international visitors, as well as the campaign to discredit Cuban medical internationalism which also lost them a lot of income, even prior to COVID-19, when 13,000 uh, medical professionals were withdrawn from Brazil under threats from Bolsonaro, likewise kicked out of Bolivia, likewise kicked out of Ecuador with shifts of government. So they are having economic problems. And, and one of the consequences was a series of fairly short, compared to probably what you're experiencing where you are, um, but blackouts. Now, blackouts in Cuba, because of the special period where blackouts were regular and they lasted 12 hours in some places, you know, they have a special connotation in Cuba. This coincided with a surge in the pandemic, an incredible surge that you can sort of map, you know, you see a line and it, June, from June uh, 2021, it just goes up and up and up and up and up. And it just doesn't, even when measures are taken, strict controls, it doesn't seem to come down. So this happens. Um, and there is a Facebook page in this area, which is for residents, but it's residents who no longer live there uh, as well. So lots of them are in the US. Now there's three administrators, at least one of them is open about his identity. And he's a um, religious pastor in Miami. OK, and um, completely, you know, political right wing anti-communist. The two others have uh, pseudonames. One of them, um, I, won't, I, I won't say the names because I don't want to give publicity, but the profile picture is the decapitated head of the president of Cuba. So these people are running this Facebook page and they, you know, they do this interview with a uh, Cuban reactionary press that's based in Spain. And they start boasting through this interview, right? And so it, what seems like a very harmless residential Facebook page, which for years is just about, oh, I've got a spare sofa who wants to swap it and so on. Um, but then they start talking about their team. They have a team of 20, right? So who's this team and who's paying them and what makes them a team, right? And then they say, you know, we spent years since 2017 posting messages, calling people out on the street, and we never had any response. So they claim that they, they sought to make the most of the opportunity created. That is exactly how they present it, by the surge in COVID, surge in deaths. You're talking about, you know, increased misery, uh, fatalities and so on, and the electricity blackout. So basically exploit this really difficult um, situation and people's frustration and fear because there was fear, you know, the Cubans had never seen their public health care system overwhelmed. And that's what happened in the places where there was a surge. Hospitals were overwhelmed for the first time. The rest of us have seen it. You know, even the National Health Service was overwhelmed. Hospitals and emergency, uh, emergency, whatever status. So um, they said, we use this opportunity, we call people out. They said, we weren't expecting anyone to come. We didn't even turn up. That's what they claim. This might be just to protect their own, uh, who their real identities are. But then people did turn up, right? So you get a couple of hundred people and they march around, they go to try and get into the police station, then they march back and then it turns violent. And um, all of the time 
it's being broadcast live on social media and then it's amplified by the people in the United States who have huge followings and this is why you know uh, I don't know it's very hard to say how much was spontaneous because at the same time media analysts have pointed out things like the protests had the same symbols like placards cool where they see they is one of the uh, organizational symbols. Now, Cool Weather Sea Day is an organization um, which has among its leaders um, Paya, and she is someone who has, uh, you know, there are documented links to funding through some of the institutions that get funding from the US Congress, the NED, and, and National Endowment for Democracy, and so on. So, I mean, it does happen, and it's, and it's shocking but it's also over within a couple of hours because I think it's about by about this this cult, uh, people get together at ten or eleven right and they start marching around by I think two in the afternoon Miguel Diaz Canal having heard about the violent protest has gone to the area the president of Cuba is there and he starts marching through the streets and the neighbors come out and he's talking to them he's saying we know the situation is difficult we know you know that there's no electricity we've prioritized um the the co the hospitals because of the covid surge they're gen you know they're using much more electricity so we've had to uh, prioritize them and 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 also the resources that we've needed to deal to tackle covid-19 so he's marching around the barrio by two so that's when he makes his first statement to the cuban journalists in the street the streets belong to the revolutionaries and then he goes on to the television interrupting my uh, watching of the Euro Championships, and he makes a statement, tells people what has happened, and again uh, talks about, uh, refers to the streets belonging to the revolutionaries. So at that point, thousands of Cubans who weren't already on the streets go out onto the streets. And in fact, I knew Cubans who had, on hearing or seeing on social media that there were violent protests, without waiting for anyone to summon them, had gone to their workplace because you know, work, that's how Cubans organize politically, it's often through their workplaces, that's their political mobilization. They had up in, spontaneously gone there to defend their workplaces. So by that point, there probably are, you know, 100,000 on the street, but they were in defense of the Cuban revolution and in defense of socialism. And you had this incredible situation where you had Ted Cruz or Marco Rubio and all these people uh, the mayor of Miami speaking on Fox News, talking about this momentous moment in Cuba and the mayor of Miami saying we should consider airstrikes. I don't know if you heard that. I did. Say yeah. that. And meanwhile, in the background, they're showing footage of Cubans on the street, but they have movement of the 26th of July flags, which is a real indication that they are pro-revolution, pro-socialism. There was a lot of distortion. There was even an image images where the, the placards have been blurred out. And that shows that there is some editorial knowledge that they are manipulating imagery. Subsequently, incredible stuff came out. Images from May Day with a million people out in 2018 saying, this is Havana today. Images from the Malacon in Egypt. Yeah, because it yeah. has a similar yeah. sweep and shape as the uh, Havana Malacon. But clearly, if you zoomed in, there were Egyptian flags, you know? So um, images of, of people uh, blood and brutalized. There was footage of, you know, even I, when I saw this footage first, I was a bit shocked. It was um, the, uh, a few days later, because the police were going through footage and arresting uh, Cubans who, you know, were accused of violent disorder. And they burst into someone's house and the policeman is holding a gun that's in the footage. And then there's, uh, you see the manipulation come in because there's gunshots and then there's a vision of a pool of blood on the floor and a woman screaming, what have they done to my husband? So this was being circulated with the implication that this Cuban had been shot dead in his own home by police who'd burst in. What did the Cubans do in response? They showed this on national television. They said, have you seen this video? It's circulating. Look, it's got 34,000 uh, likes and, and re circulates whatever and then they they interviewed the actual guy they showed footage of him being taken from his house walking unaided very calmly handcuffed behind his back but walking calmly to the police patrol 
and then being interviewed in his home two days later saying, yeah, I was arrested, I was booked for this and that, and then I was um, I was released and I've been at home, today's Friday. So, you know, the Cubans were doing what they could to combat this incredible media barrage and, and propaganda, but of course that never got disseminated outside of Cuba. And it is a big issue, right? The language issue is really important. So the lie gets disseminated in English globally, but the corrective doesn't get disseminated. And right, I, and you also, by the way, oh, sorry. That, yeah. so I was just going to say that's why shows like this are really important, and the, the kind of work you do. I mean, Breakthrough News did some fantastic videos on the protests and and you know exposing that sort of image and 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 this narrative that was fake news. Yeah, no, in English, it's it's uh, it's certainly difficult to to break through, if you will, in English too, because you're also up against not just the right wing like Fox News sort of Ted Cruz style people, but also there's this uh, sort of liberal class of like musicians, you know, um, who like are pro Black Lives Matter, but then they're like, but SOS Cuba. And some of them are from, are like, you know, descend, like our Miami Cubans. Um, and that actually has an impact on the way like the young people following them think. So, I mean, the level of propaganda in the U.S. is just so widespread across the ideological spectrum uh, that it is difficult to break through. So it's important to hear that from you. But I also think it's interesting, you know, I don't think there's any like easy answer to this. And you, you have like written reasons for this, but I guess I'd want to hear your your take on this now, because I think when it comes to like revolutions, it's it's hard to keep them alive, if, especially if you look at a lot of other places where there's been revolutions. And what I mean by that is it's just like after the first generation, the revolutionary generation passes, uh, it becomes, I think, more difficult for the next generation to know like what it is that that they have to lose. Like, what was it like before the revolution? Uh, and I think that's why so many politicians in the U.S. thought that, like, after Castro died, uh, Cuba was done. But the revolution has continued. And as we saw with these recent protests, like, people came out in mass to demonstrate their solidarity with the revolution. So what do you think it is about Cuba that, like, three generations later now is able to you know, maintain this sort of understanding across the population of the importance of this revolution, despite it having happened so long ago. Yeah, it's something that they talk about quite a lot in Cuba, actually. Um, every generation, every new generation needs its heroic moment or it needs its, its um, space to be protagonistic. It needs to recreate the revolution in its own image. So in, you know, just after the revolution, you had a generation who were probably too young to participate in the um, either the underground urban movement or the guerrilla struggle. But they then played an absolutely essential role in the literacy campaign. So you're talking about hundreds of thousands of young people who went, you know, all around the country, up mountains and uh, into jungles, of not <laughs> over fields and so on to to. Um, teach their fellow Cubans to read and write. Then subsequently you have um, the internationalist missions. And so for the 1970s, the really big project is the um, something like 400,000 Cubans who went voluntarily to Angola to help the Angolans fight for their independence against the invading army of, uh, white army of apartheid South Africa. And, you know, Nelson Mandela himself, there's a new film, which I can't wait to see about, about, you know, Cuba and Africa and focusing on that. And um, Nelson Mandela himself said this was an, the, the Cubans assistance to Angola and the victory that that led to was essential in the defeat of the apartheid regime in South Africa. So that was that generation. And, um, and then, you know, you had similar programs that the, the intervention in Angola starts in the 70s, ends in the 80s. And then, you know, you have survival mode. The 1990s is just, but, but you have those heroic acts, you know, of sacrifice and commitment, which I began this show by talking to about the young Cubans who volunteered to go and do this extremely hard work in the countryside to help feed the nation. And then in the 2000 periods, and there's a whole chapter on my book, We Are Cuba, about this, is the battle of ideas, which begins as the battle to, um, 
get the little shipwrecked Cuban boy, Elian Gonzalez, um, from Miami back to his loving father in Cuba. And that turns into a huge international battle. And so I think we get to the 2010s and on, and then this becomes a question, right? What it, What is the sort of the heroic struggle or the sort of protagonistic role of young Cubans? And, you know, when we were talking about um, what happened on the 11th of July and we talked about COVID, well, one of the, another really important aspect here is you know, I've talked about the organizations of the masses. Cubans have many forums in which they uh, debate, argue, dispute, confer, agree, and so on. Uh, in their neighborhoods, in their workplaces, in their study centers, in schools, and so on. With COVID, because Cuba took a very strict uh, path from an epidemiological um perspective it was you know it was the correct thing to do they closed down many public spaces and collective spaces and what that meant is that um the, the cubans didn't have those forums where they can normally fresh out you know criti make criticisms come to agreements understand different perspectives and so on and that coincides um, i mean that comes shortly after um the number of Cubans who are accessing social media on their phones increases massively. So that's from 2018, and it goes up and up and up. So what this means is that during this COVID period, the economic situation is deteriorating, the health situation from summer um, becomes quite scary uh, with the surge of COVID cases, still comparatively minimal compared even to Britain, uh, but for the Cubans, it's, it's very alarming. And at the same time, you know what they're, they're getting so much influence through social media and social media is um it's it's not you know spontaneously generated material there are social media influences who are set up with funding and put there with a political objective to tell cubans that all of their problems are not the result of the u.s sanctions or COVID pandemic that the whole world is suffering, but actually incompetence and inefficiency by the government or the government doesn't care and so on. So, um, you know, that was a really key thing. Now, how does the Cuban government respond? How does it respond to this problem? There clearly is a problem among young Cubans. And I think you made, you touched on the point, which I, I think is vitally important. Uh, people in Cuba are, so accustomed to having, you know, 96% of Cubans own their own home. They don't face the, the fear of homelessness that is faced around the world. They own their own home. If they rent a home, they can not legally pay more than 4% of their income. They have free access to healthcare, education, things like utilities. Even now they're complaining that the cost of electricity has gone up. It's still heavily subsidized. Transport is heavily subsidized, even though some of the costs have just gone up. It remains heavily subsidized. So in a sense, the problem is that a lot of Cubans take that for granted. And then they look over outside and more influence from social media. They want some of the best of consumer capitalist societies, but they certainly don't want it at the cost of what the socialist state provides them. <laughs> And I think this is a dilemma, you know, how does the uh, Cuban government and its institutions tackle that problem, tackle that gulf between uh, lived experience and aspirations? And um, uh, yeah, I mean, the only way, the way that they've done it till now is, is politics and ideology and talking all the time. And I think, well, I just want to say something else because we talked about the 11th of July, but there was also, uh, aspirations or hopes, investments, let's say, in making, uh, in reproducing or that protest on the 15th of November. You probably heard about that, right? And the US, US officials from September to 15th of November made 180 statements, whether they were tweets or, or statements, about these great big protests that were going to take place, uh, you know, against 180. The Cuban, yeah, um, against the Cuban regime. And, and it was essentially for the objectives, it was a flop. Now, partly it was a flop because the Cuban government has 
not stop. Miguel Diaz Canal personally hasn't stopped for one day since the 11th of July actually addressing the problems which motivated people to come out on the street and complain. And he has gone uh, along with Gerardo Hernandez, who is uh, very much held up as a hero in Cuba. He's one of the Cuban five um, who was you know, incarcerated in, in the United States for having infiltrated uh, right wing Miami organizations and to find out about plans against Cuban people and so on and so forth. And they have gone to poor neighborhoods, uh, majority black neighborhoods, and they have talked to people, they have helped to reinvigorate those grassroots organizations, which, as I said, were later partly because of COVID, but partly because there's a certain complacency there anyway. And in some ways, what happened on the 11th of July has been politically useful for Cuba. I mean, I don't know if you saw, two days ago, there was a huge march. They have, a, you know, the university students, 27th of November, they have a huge march anyway uh, to commemorate some medical students. But, you know, it was massive. And this is young people going out, also commemorations around the fifth anniversary of Fidel Castro's death. So in some ways, this has um, really uh, kind of forced key leaders to uh, not postpone addressing, but to address right now some of the socio and economic problems that they have and to increase the level of communication with the population. Because, you know, outside of Cuba, people love to mock Fidel Castro for his four hour speeches. But actually, many Cubans will say to you that they miss that, that they that, you know, having that engagement with Fidel, although he was the one talking, they felt like it was a conversation. And he would talk about things. He would go from the, the great big schema of globalization and global relations and imperialism and theory and so on to their everyday problems, the price of bread, as we can say, the price of malanga, you know, the cost of an electricity. And if you leave your bulb on for an hour, uh, how much it costs and how much the state pays and how much you pay out of your pocket. You know, these kind of, they might seem outside of Cuba banal explanations, but actually they were really important. Cubans are very highly educated and, you know, they, they like to understand exactly what the scenario is. And I think even the fact that the day after the 11th of July, protests, you had the electricity, the Minister of Electricity um, explaining why there were these blackouts, what, you know, the problem of obtaining fuels. And then actually he was interrupted by Miguel Diaz Canal, who happens to be an electrical engineer by training. And he also used to teach at the university who, who explained that, you know, different facilities or different generators use different fuels and they have had problems getting certain fuels. So they have to use certain other if they use other fuels, it can lead to maintenance problems and breakdowns, and then they need spare parts. And, you know, really contextualizing this. So it's not, ah, the blockade, it's just an excuse. No, the blockade actually obstructs us in every sector in the following ways, you know, and that kind of engagement and dialogue. So I do feel like there has been a little, we've, we've had one of those moments, and there's been quite a few, like I was saying, I was living in Cuba, on and off during the Battle of Ideas era, visiting Cuba a lot, a kind of reanimation, yeah, of uh, of these organisations, the massive remobilisation, and I think that's there is there are clearly young people in Cuba who are just thinking about you know their individual consumption and all the rest of it, and can can their aspirations be fulfilled in Cuba or not? Do they have to leave? But I, I do feel like there has been a level of re-engagement, certainly over the last couple of months, when maybe under, maybe feeling that there is a threat to the revolution, there is a threat to the socialist society and, and a sort of re-evaluation of if that was taken away, what would they lose? Man, I feel like we need to start making videos for Cubans about the terror we feel in the U.S. about getting sick. I mean, the, what you just described, I mean, I know obviously like Cubans suffer from all these deteriorating sort of like living conditions issues but i mean not having to worry about like being able to afford medical care or rent i mean geez rent the amount of money we spend on rent in the global north or in any capital in lebanon even i mean lebanon is like the polar opposite of cuba in the sense that it's like hyper capitalist to like a libertarian degree and as it collapses like 
the level of poverty is so extreme. I wish there was, you're talking about 12 hour power cuts. Like there's people who have money. Like I have, I get paid in dollars. So I'm someone here who has money and I only have electricity for 14 hours a day. And I'm really lucky. Like, so just 12 hours, like being a lot, it's like, oh, that's normal here for everyone, even people who have money. So anyways, it's, it's quite an interesting, an interesting parallel. And it's interesting to hear all that. I guess, you know, I do appreciate all of your time. I wanted to, something to end on here is to, I guess, give you an opportunity to tell us, you know, where can people follow your work? I know you recently released a documentary that you worked on. Uh, and it's, I think you that was the second documentary you've done in the, like the last year involving Cubo. So why don't you tell everyone a little bit about that? Okay, so the first documentary, I have this habit now of, um, fil you know, filming the interviews in summer and then having like two months to make it before premiere in November. So I'm not doing that again. <laughs> The first one was in 2020 and that was about Cuba's response to COVID-19 and it does explain through the voice of Cubans how their public healthcare system works, how and why their biotech sector was established and some of the um, medicines that they developed and adapted for COVID-19 and how you know they used door-to-door uh, -door knocks for truck and trace and all the rest of it. Um, the new documentary was filmed again in the summer, that's why we were there this summer. Um, and it was filmed, uh, it was to premiere at COP because uh, COP26, the International Climate Change Conference, was hosted in Glasgow, which is where we are. And um, it was about Cuba's unique state plan to combat climate change. So the Cubans, like, you know, it, it makes sense that there is something exceptional about Cuba when it comes to a global health public, a global public health crisis. And you know, the most serious threat to, to humanity today, which is climate change. The Cubans have a plan for adaptation and mitigation, which prioritizes protecting their population, their environment and the economy. So obviously, you know, Cuba is responsible for 0.08% of carbon emissions. But like all the small island nations and global south in general, they are actually in the front line and most vulnerable to climate change. And, you know, they are already losing 1.2 meters of their territory every year. So climate change is not, a, you know, a hypothetical thing in the future. It's very much threatening Cuba today. But they are using um, natural solutions, science, their si incredible scientific knowledge and scientific institutions, organization, planning and community participation to put in to implement this basically 100 year policy to uh, to protect the population and environment from climate change. So that is um, the new documentary is called Cuba's Life Task Combating Climate Change. And it should be available on YouTube for everyone to see for free uh, by mid December, if not before. Excellent. And then also, can you give people an idea of where they should go if they want to help Cuba right now? I know there's a lot of campaigns out there that people can contribute to as people as obviously Cuba's experiencing shortages of all kinds of things. Yeah. So if you're in the U.S., um, I think that there's lots of U.S. campaigns who are doing quite, quite well at working together, you know, coalition saving lives campaigns. Uh, and there is also in March next year, a big national conference. And um, if you're in Canada, there's the Canadian network on Cuba. Um, and so, and there are campaigns in most countries, there are solidarity organizations and campaigns. As you said, the focus through this year has been on raising money to buy syringes and other, I mean, I mean, isn't it a terrible juxtaposition? Cuba's sending uh, personnel around the world to save lives, but they couldn't access, you know, syringes. But anyway, <laughs> we've discussed that. So, yeah, wherever you are, there are campaigns. And if there isn't, then, you know, contact the Ministry of Public Health in Cuba and, and, and see, you know, what you can help with, I guess. Well, Helen Yaffe, I want to thank you so much for your incredible work and what I'm sure is more to come. So I want to pre-thank you for that and also for all your time breaking this down for us. Thank you so much for inviting me on the show. It's a great show.